thank you very much everyone welcome to uh, bba forum july we have some very interesting and important uh, talks today um, the uh, first speaker is uh, professor mary lesity mary is a, a fantastic lady we have known mary for a long time she's been a, a senior editor of the jbba uh, for a number of years, she has published many papers in, in the journal as well. And um, she's a professor of uh, information systems at uh, University of Arkansas in the USA. And um, she is uh, going to uh, share with us uh, her uh, the findings of the uh, recent research that she has um, uh, she is working on, which is on uh, B two B commerce in in permissionless decentralized um, networks so i would like to invite mary to please come forward and uh, share uh, with us uh, her research thank you okay thank you dr nasim and good morning everybody or good i should say good afternoon it's morning here in the united states so um i'm very happy that i was invited to um, share our working paper and so first i'd like to acknowledge my co-authors so i have um, I'm working with Professor Dan O'Leary, who is at the University of Southern California's Marshall School of Business. And we have a professor here along with me in the Sam Walton College of Business, Professor Dan Conway. So I guess one of the things about the University of Arkansas, in the United States, we are ranked number one in undergraduate programs in supply chain and number two in graduate programs by Gartner. So our college spends a lot of time thinking about supply chains. And so I know many people, including people in this room, um, are aware that the global supply chain of let's talk about the B2B commerce market is worth about $22 trillion a year. And as an information systems professor, it always shocks me how much of this work is actually still done in paper. And when trading partners say, oh, we, we digitized, really many of them are just still scanning paper documents and delivering them via email. Or at best, we have electronic data interchange, which is a technology that dates back to the 1960s. So I know our community here and my co-authors and, and uh, those folks in our Sam Walton College of Business you know, thought maybe blockchains would be the new architecture for global B2B commerce. So in fact, I have spent years researching and publishing on enterprise blockchain applications and supply chains. I've written four books. The case studies kept getting bigger and bigger. Then 2022 happened, and many of these B2B applications we studied were shut down. And I'm sure everyone in the room is aware of like shutdowns at Everledger and TradeLens and WeTrade and Marco Polo and B3i and the Australian Securities Exchanges. So I found myself as a researcher pivoting from doing enterprise blockchain adoption studies to actually performing blockchain autopsies. So our autopsy research, you know, does have very rich findings as far as the causes of failures, but I'm just going to share the one common thing they all had in common. They were all built on private blockchain networks. Okay, so we've now learned that private networks, they lack interoperability, they lead to vendor lock-in, and many of them were really designed by the founders to extract most of the value, and it wasn't, the value really wasn't shared with the broader trading partners that they intended to attract. Another major finding is none, I say none, of the private blockchain failures stem from technical issues. Okay, so then people say, well, you know, why did so many pick private blockchains in the first place? Well, many of these were started in about 2018. We had a lot of immaturity in the public blockchain market. Ethereum was only about three years old then. So enterprises had really legitimate concerns about trying to launch solutions on public networks. However, we have had so many innovations in the last couple of years, both on technology, on the standard making fronts, and even the regulatory front, that's really lessened the obstacles. So our thesis is that the next generation of, of global supply chains will be on public blockchain networks. Okay, so what our research really has done is, okay, how do enterprises prepare for this world of supply chains on global public networks and we identified 11 enterprise capabilities and i want to thank uh, dr nasim i see that you have one slide that um, kind of summarizes all those capabilities in the back here but i'll just quickly cover cover them 
So we're going to talk about three domains. There's an ecosystem domain, there's a shared business and governance domain, and there's a technical domain, and these 11 capabilities kind of fall within that. So enterprise capabilities, I mean, I'm sorry, ecosystem capabilities really equip the enterprise to effectively engage with ecosystem players beyond their direct trading partners. And these capabilities include participating in data and technical standard making bodies, educating and lobby policymakers. I'm so proud of the BBA because um, I think you've all done a wonderful job about uh, trying to educate policymakers and also monitoring and even influencing the involving public blockchain space. So I look at um, an organization like the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance as a good example. Okay, moving on to the shared business and government's capabilities, these equip an organization to negotiate agreements with their direct trading partners. And one of the things we learned from the first generation failures is that business value and decision making rights must be shared shared, else it just makes more sense to use an application that operates on a centralized network. We also found that you need really strong leadership capabilities to both envision and to properly resource a new B2B model. That, that's a huge effort. Okay, moving on to the technical domain, enterprises don't have to have these in-house. They could build them, but they can also buy or rent these te technical capabilities. But enterprises need expertise with privacy protocols like zero-knowledge proofs and multi-party computation. They need expertise on asset tokenization. One mistake we see a lot of networks making is they tokenize the paperwork, like the invoices or the bill of lading, instead of tokenizing the asset itself. They also need expertise with scalability protocols like Layer 2 and verifiable credentials because enterprises cannot transact anonymously. They need to know who their trading partners, customers, and employees are. Okay, so if you take these 11 capabilities, that should culminate in the ability to code or at least audit uh, agreements using smart contracts that apply the data and technical standards and that comply with all laws and regulations. So going to the future, if we can finally have enterprises able to successfully transact um, on public decentralized networks, we'll be able to unlock a lot of business value from eliminating the need for reconciliations, for ensuring the authenticity and condition of assets, and being able to trace the physical location and legal custody of assets through supply chains. And then I guess the one other thing I'll just add is it's not just going to be blockchain technology. Technology. It's going to be IoT so that you can get the condition of assets and, of course, um, artificial intelligence that can help with, ana um, with analytics and prediction. Okay, so, yay, go public, go public blockchains. Okay, Dr. Nassim, I think I did that in under six minutes. Yes, you did, and you did okay. very well. <laughs> yeah, you did very well. You did very well. That's a very nice summary, and, and I think I, I'm sure people who have uh, questions uh, if you have any burning questions please do share in the chat box otherwise uh, you can contact uh, us or contact mary directly via email um, the slide is there uh, which summarizes the, the the research and i'm sure there'll be more to come on on public blockchains um, mary just one question the research that you're doing um, is that ethereum or, or are you going to look into other public blockchains as well? Well, the reality is it's most of the default is yes. Ethereum right now. So we have, um, you know, a lot of the companies we still work with from the, what we used to have here was the um, Blockchain Center of, Expo, uh, of um, Excellence. We still do work with um, EY, who's been committed to Ethereum from the beginning. So I'm not saying there can't, can't be other public networks, but it seems like the front runner right now is Ethereum. And I'm sorry, I'm sitting on Joey's lap. I'm going to try to move. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Thank you very much okay. for your time. So that was uh, that was fantastic. Uh, thanks, Mary.